way. <clears throat> Well, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to be giving you a presentation today on Dragonfly's deep learning solution. The goal of today's presentation will be not just to introduce you to the materials and the features that are new in Dragonfly associated with the deep learning, but to give you the practical tools you need to get it installed and configured and operational and get you started in using it. So again, thank you for joining me today. Uh, the webinar that we are doing right now will be recorded so that it is being recorded so that it can be streamed later. So, uh, and feel free to send questions by email to uh, support at theobjects.com. More on that later. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So again, thank you for joining. The agenda today will tell you a little bit very briefly about ORS, about Dragonfly and Dragonfly Deep Learning. Then we'll tell you about getting Dragonfly and Dragonfly Deep Learning up and running on your computer and how to use it. We'll mention how to share and reuse deep learning models, and we'll also talk about getting help from ORS. So on the first topic about ORS, Dragonfly, and Deep Learning, if, you've, if you're new to ORS, Dragonfly is a our flagship product for image visualization, image processing, visualization and interpretation. And uh, our company goes back to about 2004. We've got software products uh, in the medical space, which is our ORS visual, and in the research space. And uh, we've got users uh, spread across the globe. So Dragonfly is the product that we're talking about today. And the domain of Dragonfly is mostly 3D, but also 2D and 4D image visualization image measurement, image processing, image segmentation, and the resulting quantitative analysis. Okay, very good. So this is the domain of Dragonfly. If you're doing uh, research microscopy or image data collection that you need to do quantitative analysis, then Dragonfly is the solution for you. So we sort of fill all of these needs for our users. Now, uh, we released Dragonfly in 2016, and we've been rapidly innovating ever since. So we'll talk uh, briefly about that. Um, because we have retooled all of the software in 2015 and 2016, we retooled and built Dragonfly so that all of our developer tools are in Python. It means that our developer team is much more productive at developing and innovating and creating new features and uh, maintaining those features. It also means that end users can take advantage of that and write their own Python extensions. So we'll talk a little bit about those features. Um, uh, one important note is Dragonfly is free for non-commercial use in most countries. So uh, we do call your attention to that if you're, uh, if you're doing non-commercial use. Now, um, I talk about Dragonfly and how we can innovate very rapidly. We introduced Dragonfly in 2016, and it was this platform for correlative visualization, image processing, etc. Um, then the next year, we updated enough features that we launched Dragonfly 3.0, and <clears throat> that had a number of new features, such as our macro engine and our segmentation trainer, which was our first machine learning image segmentation, as well as a number of other new features. Shortly after that, we introduced 3.1, which uh, introduced our infinite toolbox, it updated our Python tools for developers from Python 3.5 to 3.6. We continued to innovate it, introduced uh, 4D rendering for four-dimensional data sets. Then earlier this year, 3.5 came out, which has a new feature called Visual Shapes, which is useful for image processing and for rendering. We also uh, introduced our auto processor for automatic segmentation, more image segmentation tools, uh, such as Active Contour. And then more recently, we introduced 3.6, which adds a few minor updates. But the biggest update, of course, is our deep learning, which is what we're talking about today. So when we try and focus on what to do in Dragonfly, um, as, a, as our product management moves forward, we're usually focused on image segmentation because we understand how, it, how pivotal that is to our users' productivity. And we also try and keep a focus on ease of use and having reproducible processing workflows. I think what you'll see today in our deep learning solution is that we check all of these boxes with our innovation in deep learning. Now, um, I'm not showing very much of what's in Dragonfly, so I'm just giving you a couple of, of short videos to give you an idea of what the Dragonfly is in case you're new to it. Here's a four-dimensional data set. This comes from uh, Ryan McCone at Harvard, where a user is loaded a four-dimensional data set and interactively visualizes it and changes the time step. And then if a user wants to make an animation, he can just put one, uh, one keyframe of the animation at time point zero in the 4D data set and another at time point uh, uh, 500 in the data set and then have it animate. So this just shows manipulating 4D data sets. 
um, in the next very quick, and so this data, of course, as I just mentioned, comes from Ryan McCone and uh, Shmuel Rubenstein at Harvard, and uh, they're doing some really terrific work there. So uh, here's another short video that discusses just some of our segmentation tools. Most of the tools in this video are unique to Dragonfly. This is an idea of segmenting data based on super pixel segmentation where a user is uh, moving around and uh, painting parts of the cell, but instead of painting individual pixels, he's able to paint uh, clusters of pixels based on uh, super pixel gridding. So we call this smart grid, and it's based on super pixel segmentation. So in this case, you're just using that tool to do the manual manual painting, but very quick manual painting of a, of a HeLa cell captured by FibSim electron microscopy. In this sequence, you're seeing the user look and try and do painting in three-dimensional space. Anytime you have to do painting on individual pixels in 2D, it's going to be slow and painful and laborious. If instead you can use a 3D paintbrush and paint in 3D, or paint as we just saw in the super pixels in 2D where you're painting multiple clusters of pixels at a time, it's going to speed you up and make you more productive. So these are some of the tools in the toolkit. Um, all of the tools you're seeing right now have been available in Dragonfly since early 2017. So you're just seeing 3D painting. When it comes to automatic segmentation via machine learning type solutions, we introduced a solution last year which is based on some simple linear algebra machine learning tools such as Random Forest. This is quite similar to the uh, Weka segmentation available in Fiji. Uh, Zeiss has a solution quite similar to this called Intellisys. Some of our other competitors have this. And the idea is with this type of machine learning, a user paints a few representative pixels. So in this case, I painted some pores blue and some organic material green and some quartz maroon and uh, some uh, calcite magenta. With this sort of machine learning tool, the software learns from your example and tries to extrapolate to the rest of the image. So this is the result of what we call segmentation trainer, and you can see that it's able to extrapolate to the rest of the image, and it only previews on the area that you're, you're working on. So you can evaluate your criteria, evaluate, and then proceed when you think you've got a good segmentation trainer. Now, this is a powerful tool, and it does do automatic segmentation, but it does have its limits. So what I'm showing you in this slide is Segmentation Trainer. Our machine learning image segmentation strategy at ORS for Dragonfly has proceeded in two stages. The first stage was to build a user-friendly segmentation tool using the random forest and other simple linear algebra machine learning engines. And uh, we released that last year, and it's quite successful, but it does have limitations. We wanted to introduce deep learning, our deep learning solution, which incorporates convolutional neural network engine, and this uh, reduces some of the burden on the user. It means the user doesn't, the user or the programmer don't have to select the certain filter banks, and it also allows some uh, sophisticated nonlinear weighting to be applied in the model. And so Segmentation Trainer, as we said, had room for improvement, and this applies to not only our Segmentation Trainer, but the similar features from, from our competitors and other people that are doing these simple linear algebra engines. So the, the, either the user or the programmer had to identify the texture in the image with different uh, filters, and the user had to know some image processing and some domain expertise. So we wanted to transcend those requirements, and that's why we decided to switch and proceed with phase two, which is our deep learning based on convolutional neural networks. We don't have time to, in this talk, to get into the details of how this works, but as a way of background, um, I want to show you how this has been successful in the past. So there was an image segmentation challenge uh, quite some time ago where users uh, competitors were trying to come up with automatic segmentation routines for, in this case, segmenting the plasma membrane of neurons in Drosophila tissue. Uh, yeah, in Drosophila mouse brain tissue collected by t uh, serial section TEM. There were some ground truth images provided and some test images uh, withheld that were also the ground truth that we used for evaluation. The winning solution uh, found great success, but then, um, and, and here's an example of, of the winning solution uh, performed by this Swiss lab uh, back in 2012. A few years later, about a year and a half ago in December 2016, a paper appeared where there was a new neural network developed to solve this problem and it had even better accuracy. So we wanted to build a framework that would allow users and developers to add in their own neural networks at any time to do segmentation. So for us, it was a simple matter of reading this paper that's a collaboration by this uh, South Korean group and workers at Harvard. Uh, to simply read their implementation, read the details that are described in their paper of the network topology, and then reproduce that fusion net architecture in Dragonfly so that we can use it and others can reuse it. So all of the materials that we have 
in Dragonfly right now, all the neural networks are just re-implementations based on the literature. But users can develop their own. So we'll get in, uh, in a few minutes, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of how you can do this. But Dragonfly gives you a tool for storing multiple uh, deep learning filters or neural networks, and users can visualize the network topology, which could be uh, a deep network that's quite shallow or a deep network that's quite deep. Users can uh, edit these models and can draft their own tools and can do real-time previews on images. Our solution uh, in this space has been to take uh, technology such as Google's TensorFlow, which uh, is abstracted by Keras. Now we're using a particular technology. These are these are both maintained by Google. Keras is in fact an abstraction that can work with either Google's TensorFlow or University of Montreal's Tiano or Microsoft's MCTK. In our case, we're just working with TensorFlow. And what we're doing is we are literally standing on the shoulders of giants. I should say figuratively standing on the shoulders of giants here because we're not redeveloping new neural networks network tools, we're reusing existing libraries, and we're performing an exercise in software engineering so that Dragonfly users can benefit from all of these tools without having to understand how any of them work. So we've built with TensorFlow, we've built with Keras, and these tools that you develop in Dragonfly work directly in our standard image filters toolbox. You can reuse these on new data, you can retrain on new data, and very importantly, you can share your deep learning filters with others so they can modify and retrain. They can be shared in our, in our app store, which we call Infinite Toolbox. So I'm very careful to say that we are, in fact, standing on shoulders of giants. We haven't done anything new in computer science. We're not making, even at this point, any new neural networks. We're not making any new artificial intelligence engines. Instead, we're taking some of these developer tools some of these arcane features that are available for experts, and we're wrapping them into a user-friendly interface so others can use them. So our solution gives a couple of advantages. We've adopted a natural division of labor. So experts can design and tune the machine learning tools. I'll show you today how you can get started on that. And that means that microscopists and image processors can use those like any other image filter and treat it as a black box. So you don't have to know anything about it in order to use it. So there is that division of labor. You can have talent in your research group tune and tweak, or you can rely on collaborators. And then when you're actually applying the filters, you don't have to know how they work. So this really reduces the barrier to entry for deep learning. You don't, as a user, you don't have to understand or know how to write any C code for TensorFlow. You don't know how to have to write any Python code for Keras. You don't have to know anything about uh, neural networks. You can just find what's described in the literature. You don't have to use arcane tools like command line features on, on Linux. Now, so that's enough about ORS, Dragonfly, and Dragonfly Deep Learning. Now, how do you get Dragonfly and Dragonfly Deep Learning, and how do you and how do you use it? So, the next few slides will talk about sort of the licensing and uh, making sure you can get the uh, proper uh, libraries, and you're able to purchase it if you want, as well as the installers and the system requirements. So. Uh, just point of clarification, there are two products that come from ORS. There is Dragonfly and there is Dragonfly Pro. So anytime you buy Dragonfly from ORS or from most of our distributors, you're buying, you're buying Dragonfly, and that's usually a general use license. The exact same software is available for non-commercial use, not in all territories. It depends on if you're in uh, one of our Asian territories supported by a separate distributor, in which case you can go directly to the distributor to find out what your licensing options are. So we do offer the non-commercial licensing for free in most territories. Um, Dragonfly Pro is the edition that's distributed through Zeiss. All of the Dragonfly and Dragonfly Pro users are uh, eligible to evaluate and license Dragonfly Deep Learning. And so Deep Learning is, again, free for our non-commercial users in select territories. Now, getting started for new users, you will have to install Dragonfly. You can fill out the form at uh, theobjects.com slash get Dragonfly, and we'll send you a download link. After you do that, you will have to install the add-on for Dragonfly Deep Learning, and that's available at Deep Learning Get. And you'll see that on the next few slides where that goes. For existing users, um, you have already installed Dragonfly or Dragonfly Pro. You will have to install Dragonfly Deep Learning, but you'll also have to request that your license key be activated for Deep Learning. So uh, if you're evaluating, then we can give you the evaluation uh, key on that. If you're purchasing, then uh, we can give you the, the uh, permanent key for that. So um, you must install uh, Dragonfly and install Deep Learning, and if you're an existing user, you need to request that your license have the activity for Deep Learning. 
So theobjects.com slash dragonfly has this page, and you can read more about deep learning by uh, clicking on the deep learning. This page has a lot of information, particularly if you uh, click the Get Deep Learning for Dragonfly link, you will see uh, this page, which allows you to see that you meet the system requirements. It'll tell you how to install the add-on module, and it'll tell you what your options are for licensing. Um, in the way of system requirements, Dragonfly's current implementation of deep learning does depend upon a CUDA enabled GPU, which means you need to have an NVIDIA GPU. In the future, um, actually, it's something we could support um, for individual users if you need to ask for help. We could give you the steps to switch that requirement off if you want to go about using your CPU instead of a GPU, if you do not have a CUDA-enabled GPU. However, you will strongly benefit from a performance gain if you have the proper GPU, all described on this page. So, um, now, that's uh, getting you up and running and having Dragonfly working with a proper in installation, installation and having the proper license. Now let's talk about uh, about getting Dragonfly uh, up and how to how to get started with the deep learning. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can download and execute previously trained neural network models. Um, some uh, some models are simple, some are more advanced. So the advanced to deep neural networks can go from something like 95% even higher accuracy. We'll talk about retraining models that you download, which means you can keep the weights or you can randomize the weights and get started with your own training data. Um, the, some advanced topics we won't cover today are how you can freeze some layers of the neural network um, when you're retraining so that you're, uh, you're preserving some of those weights. You can also uh, also not covered in today's webinar is how you can import a Keras file directly, so one you find online or one you make yourself because you've re-implemented a neural network that's described in the literature. You can also draft and edit your own custom model using our, our graphical user interface tools without having to write any, any Python or C code at all. And then, uh, and then we'll move on. So I think what I'll do now is I'll switch over to Dragonfly and we'll talk about the user interface and we'll talk about how to get you going with the deep learning solution. So um, what I'll get started by saying there are two entry points for Dragonfly's deep learning solution. If you go under Tools, you will find uh, Deep Learning Trainer, and you will also find Image Processing Toolbox. Deep Learning Trainer is where you build, configure, and train your neural networks that you want to use at any time. You can also preview it as you're doing your training. This is your studio for designing and testing and building your neural network models. Image Processing Toolbox is the standard place you go to in Dragonfly to apply any image filter, whether it's a smoothing uh, type denoising filter or an edge enhancement filter or anything of the like. But you'll find that in the same Imaging Processing Toolbox is where you'll find access to all of your uh, all of the filters that you've designed and worked with in your in your studio in your deep learning trainer. So we'll start by going to uh, deep learning trainer uh, to show you what you can see there. So uh, it will take a moment to load uh, the first time you're loading on a particular session, and uh, we'll just give it a minute here. Hmm. Oops. Sorry, I had a little baggage before we started this demo. Now, what happens when you go to uh, Deep Learning Trainer is uh, when you click here, you'll see this interface. And this interface gives you a list of all of the neural network models that are uh, loaded and configured and accessible on your computer. So we're going to come back to this panel uh, in a moment. Um, but what you will see here is that uh, this is where you will choose a model for uh, for tuning and configuring. So I'm going to close this. Uh, uh, do I need to close it? Maybe I don't need to close it for now. Now, in my case, I'm working on a computer that already has a number of models installed. If you're using Dragonfly for the deep learning for the first time, you won't have any of these models installed, in which case you'll want to turn to the Infinite Toolbox. So Infinite Toolbox is Dragonfly's app store. When you're inside Dragonfly and you request Infinite Toolbox, it will open up a browser page that will connect you to our online repository. Um, once here, you can create an account and sign in. So I'll sign in. And this allows you to see other plugins that 
have been developed and contributed by different users. So if I wanted to see, uh, for example, macros that are available, I can see the macros that have been contributed by other users. If I want to see the deep trainer filters, I can scroll down and see these. Now what we see here are two types when you're actually using an infinite toolbox. You'll notice that every uh, listing here has a, a colorful icon, and it has an icon here, or an icon here, or in some cases, in some cases both. What this means, the global icon means that's available in the infinite toolbox for you to download. What this means is that's something that is installed on your system. So I have something on my system called KitKat that I built myself, but it has not been uploaded to the infinite toolbox. So this is showing you everything that's installed locally and everything that's available from the App Store. So if I say, oh, I would like to get this uh, UNet, or if I would like to get FusionNet, remember FusionNet was described in that paper. If I click on FusionNet, then you'll t it'll tell you who uploaded it to the toolbox. It'll give you a description. In this case, it gives you the literature reference of the FusionNet. And then if you just click Install for All Users, then it will be accessible and available. Uh, next time you open up Dragonfly, it will show up in your, uh, in your deep learning trainer. So uh, that's how you access and get uh, existing models that you may want to reuse. Now, um, what you need to do is if you want to build a neural network model, you often will start with an existing one and maybe make a duplicate. So let's say I take uh, this model that was trained on uh, ceramic matrix composites and it has the architecture UNet. Uh, I can take that model and I can say I want to make, uh, and as soon as I select it, you see you can see the topology of the model, and I can ask for a duplicate. And then uh, what Dragonfly is doing is it's duplicating the entire model in memory, and now, now at the bottom of the list I have it. So I could say this is going to be my new KitKat segmentation model. So you can download one and then make a duplicate. Now, uh, at this point, what I can do is I can go to editing or I can go to training. We won't spend uh, probably any time today in the editing panel because this is covered in more advanced topics, but you can go to training. In the training panel, this is where you set up uh, and tell Dragonfly the deep learning model how to learn from uh, user examples. So let me go back to the main screen here for a second. So what we're looking at right now, I have a number of image channels loaded, and here is one of an X-ray microscopy scan collected on an X-radia versa. Uh, and it, it was uh, actually contributed uh, with time on the uh, IQBT facility at McGill University. Now, what you're looking at here are reconstructed slices of a Kit Kat chocolate bar. And so there are multiple phases here. There's air, and there's this uh, waffle-like phase, and there are these chocolate chips, and this uh, melted liquid chocolate phase. And they're all quite similar in, in brightness, so it's very difficult to segment. Now, the way one would go about building and training a neural network for this is the user has to start by providing some training data. Now, the training data is built using the standard image segmentation tools that are part of Dragonfly. Now, we could spend uh, five to six hours of webinar just talking about the segmentation tools, so we're not going to spend any time going through what they are. I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief example. I'm going to go over and I'm going to create a, a new region of interest that is the same size as my KitKat, and I'm going to call it Pores. And then I will create a new region of interest that I will call uh, maybe waffle and create a new region of interest and call this chocolate chips. And uh, I don't want to use red, so I'll use uh, maybe gold, whatever, a different color. Now, um, and there are uh, there is a lot of help in the online content for how to use the segmentation tools. There are also, in some of the training videos, you can learn about the image segmentation tools. Now, at this point, I have created um, some regions of interest, and what I would like to do is label some of the data using these tools. Now I'll start with the pores, and uh, I'll say let's uh, find the intensity that corresponds to pores, and then maybe I'll uh, use a paintbrush and uh, use my paintbrush and paint some of these pores, uh, something like this. And, uh, and if I then turn off the define range, uh, I can uh, clean up a little bit of this, uh, etc. So you can use the paint tools as one example. You can use thresholding tools. You can use the segmentation trainer. You can use any of the segmentation tools provided. Now I could uh, do the same thing with waffle, and I could define some intensity range and 
uh, let's do maybe something like that. And I could come through and say, well, all of this is, uh, is my waffle phase. And, and uh, I'll increase the contrast on that so it's a little easier to see. So I've got some pores and I've got some waffle and I could do the same thing with chocolate chips uh, and try and isolate some of the uh, chocolate phase. Now, you can do this uh, quite laboriously and thoroughly to get uh, very good uh, training examples. You can use tools uh, like the dilate or hole fill, or we could do a closing operation on the, on the chips to try and fill those in. Now, um, we're going to talk in, in a moment about how much training data is required, but it is, it is strictly true that deep learning solutions require a lot more training data than shallow neural networks or any of the superficial linear algebra engines. So while our segmentation trainer may give you good results from painting this much, um, our deep learning solution would in fact require you to paint uh, multiple slices. So we will have great success when people have painted 10 to 15 slices and segmented everything they need. So by segmenting 10 to 15 slices quite thoroughly, and this is not something we can do in, in 15 minutes or even a one hour webinar, we may have to put in uh, 10 hours of work segmenting these slices. Of course the payoff at the end is that the trained neural network is then able to segment thousands or tens of thousands of slices and we can keep imaging and imaging and imaging under these conditions and always rely on that and not have to keep putting in more and more hours of manual effort. So this is clearly not enough to train the network but you would do this sort of effort and do it on multiple slices. Once you have something like this you can take all of these and uh, you can say, I would like to combine these into something called a multiroy. And so I'm just going to label this as a four-phase multiroy. Now, I call it four-phase because it, in fact, has a phase that is pores, a phase that is chips, a phase that is waffle, and then it has all of the unlabeled pixels. If I wanted to have a, a three-phase that was just, say, uh, pores, and chips and everything else, I could recombine that and I could call that a three-phase multiroy. Now, um, when you are in the deep learning solution, what you're able to do is say, well, I would like to take this particular topology, remember we're talking about this a network that I made, I made a copy of a UNet and I called it new KitKat segmentation. And what I can do is I can, uh, on the training page I can say, I would like to use the grayscale images of my KitKat as my input training, and I would like to use the, uh, let's say, the three-phase multiroy as the target of the training data. Now, four-phase is not valid, and if I mouse over this, it'll say this multiroy needs to have three non-empty labels. Now, we'll get into some detail about that in a minute. So if you, if you only watch this far in the webinar, you may make a mistake and not be able to select the target here. We will cover that in a minute. Um, the number of phases here has to match a particular of the model. So at this point, we've given Dragonfly an input data set and the target we want to match. You could also provide a mask. So you could have a separate phase. So we could have another ROI and call this the mask. And we could tell Dragonfly, when it's doing the training, it should only train based on, you know, pixels here and here and here. It's only going to be looking at, the, at, the, uh, at, at what you tell it to evaluate with the mask. So we could, uh, again, provide that uh, uh, as an option. We could provide the mask, <clears throat> provide the mask as another input. Now, at this point, you could click train right away, and it will start training this particular network with this training data. If instead you click use validation data, you could say of all of the information, all of the pixels that it's using as input for training, you could hold back a certain fraction to be used for validation, and then you'll get a validation score uh, after it's trained. So I'm not going to click train because a network this deep will take, uh, take a little while to train and we don't have time to do that over the course of a webinar. But you could train and then you could select this trained network and ask for a preview. So after it's trained, you can scroll through to, uh, to any particular slice. Uh, and once you're on that particular slice, you could click the preview and see the results. If you don't like it, you can uh, change some of the parameters. So. That gives you enough, that gives you the very minimal amount you need to do to train the network. But there are training parameters you may want to consider. So um, we don't have time to get into any of the advanced settings on this call. 
But what we will on this webinar is talk about these introductory parameters. So when the neural network is learning, it's evaluating a square of data at a time, and that is called the patch size. So it can be 32 by 32 pixels, uh, or it can be much more. So you can configure the patch size. And the bigger the patch size, the, um, the wider the network is, and it will consume more memory. So if you think you can get away by having the neural network learn from smaller patches, then that is fine. Um, the stride to input ratio tells you how much it uses a particular patch, which is to say, if this is one, then it'll evaluate a 32 by 32 pixel square, and it'll go to the next 32 by 32 pixel square. If this were 0.5, then it will do 32 by 32, and then it will step over 16 pixels and do another 32 by 32. So that is the stride. And these are all uh, routine parameters documented in the neural network literature. Epoch's number is the number of training cycles to go through when you click the train button. You can train for one cycle, evaluate the results, and then train for another cycle, or you can tell it, I want to train for a number of cycles and then evaluate the results. So it's important to know that all neural network training can result in overtraining, so you don't want to just put this at a ridiculously large number, and each cycle can take quite a bit of time depending on the complexity of the network. So each cycle or each epoch involves um, evaluating all of the training signal, pushing it through the network with the existing weights, then taking the proper results and pushing those back through the network to evaluate the differences in order to correct the weights. And this is corrected using an optimization function. So all of that happens uh, uh, in each epoch. The batch size determines the number of inputs that are used before the network parameters are updated. The more uh, parameters, the, the larger the batch size you have, you will have uh, you will have more memory consumption during the training cycle. Um, but if if you try and choose too few a batch size, then the optimization function is subject to uh, is subject to instability. So you can leave this at the default size unless you're unless you're crunched for memory. The loss function and the optimization function are used during the evaluation of the network. So um, we're not going to talk about different optimization functions, but on one of my future slides, we will talk about some, something important about the loss function. So you could leave all of these as default and simply start training uh, by supplying an input data set and a target data set and hit train. Now, um, that is how you train a network. Once it is trained, it can be reused uh, anytime you want. So what I'll do now is I'll show you, um, for those of you who have not already seen how the networks are evaluated, we'll look uh, at, at how you can actually use a neural network. So what I'll do is I'll go into Tools, Image Processing Toolbox, down here. This is where you would apply a smoothing filter or an edge enhancement filter. In this case, we want to use a deep learning filter. And on the left, we will choose as input. In this case, we'll choose the high-res KitKat image. And I'll zoom in a little bit, and I'll give us some contrast. And on, uh, and then it tells me which model do you want to use to evaluate. And I don't want to use the new KitKat because it hasn't been trained, but I do have a KitKat segmentation routine that's based on UNet, so I can ask it to compute selected preview. What it's doing is it's it's loading the neural network into GPU memory, and then it is evaluating it on the current field of view. And so you see that it's evaluating the chocolate chip and the chocolate matrix and the poor space. Uh, this may also evaluate the waffle, or this may actually just be a three-phase model. So it only evaluates it on the area that you have selected. That way, if it's a costly evaluation, you don't have to pay for a 13,000 by 13,000 image. You can just evaluate on a small area. So um, anytime anybody wants to use one of these image filters, he or she can simply select the right network and ask for a preview and then click Apply, and it will apply on the entire stack. So we'll look at another data set, for example. So here's a material science example. Um, this is a ceramic matrix composite collected by uh, Ali Badran, uh, who's a graduate student at University of Colorado. And this data was collected at, uh, at ALS, at uh, the Advanced Light Source Beamline 8.1.3.2, and or 8.3.2, forgive me. And so um, in this particular image, you'll see that there's some interesting fibers, and there's a coating, and then there are pores, and so there's a lot to segment here. And you'll also notice that the contrast inside the fiber seems to be the same as the contrast outside the fiber, so it's a very challenging uh, tool to segment. In this case, we took a very deep network. Let me go ahead and get it started because it takes a while to evaluate on my laptop. In this case, we took uh, something called FCN DenseNet, and uh, we trained it with 16 slices of data. 
Now, the network is very dense. There are a lot of coefficients. There's a lot of math that happens. Just loading all those coefficients into my graphics card takes 30 to 40 seconds, and then evaluating the filter on a single slice uh, takes another 20 to 30 seconds. So uh, we have to be patient while we wait for this to evaluate. If you're evaluating over an entire stack of several thousand slices, it does operate one slice at a time, and it, uh, it's not as slow since it only has to load the network once. So we'll give this a minute, and then we'll see the result. Again, this is a result of a trained network. That's, so everything is encapsulated. It's all trained. You treat it as a black box. You can just apply it as a standard image filter. And so you, what you can see here is uh, it has very good fidelity. So exactly where a human would segment this fiber versus the, the coding versus the pore space is what you get in the results. And so this is a, a, a topic that we found no other solution for but putting a human in front of and segmenting these slice by slice. And so we spent 20 to 30 hours segmenting 16 representative slices. And now we have a network that can work on any of the 10,000 slices that need to be processed from this data stack. So I'll provide one more example for completeness. Uh, we'll look at, uh, at the Drosophila neurons, and we'll use uh, the membrane filter, uh, which again is the result of that fusion net that was described in the literature uh, a year and a half ago. And so in this case, you, you've got TEM sections. All the contrast is the same. Wherever the osmium goes, the image becomes dark. And so that could be on mitochondria, it could be on vesicles, and it could be on plasma membrane. So thresholding gets you nowhere. But you can see that by having uh, segmented manually slices and then using that as training data, the software is able to then figure out where the plasma membranes are and figure them out for you. So that gives you the automated segmentation. All right, let me go back to the slides now. So um, you can download a model from the, from the store, from the Infinite Toolbox. You can retrain the model. You can also reset the model. I didn't mention that, so I'll mention it now. When you are in the Deep Learning Trainer, let's pull that back up. Anytime you have a model here um, and you're on the training, the training page, uh, now I clicked a, a very dense network. Ah, there here we are, back on the training page. Um, one of the things you can do here is click Reset, and that will obliterate all the weights of the model. That means that the model topology is the same, the network layers and types still exist, but all of the coefficients built in are obliterated. So that's one option is to keep the weights or to randomize the weights. Um, so we've seen how you can retrain a model. Now, people always ask how much training data. Well, this is something there are no good answers for at this point. It's still mysterious, and we'll continue to report best practices as we develop and learn them. But I can say that we have great success in many cases where we're using only 10 to 20 slices. You want something that's representative of the image stack. So if the image is different at the top of the stack versus the bottom of the stack, make sure and choose some from the top and the bottom. And you want a balance of classes. If you're training it to, to learn chocolate chips and waffle and chocolate matrix, don't give it a million pixels of chocolate chips and five pixels of waffle. You want a balance of the training data. So you can choose the different uh, neural networks that are available in the store, or you can build your own. And the neural networks differ in the depth, that is the number of layers, the types of layers. They also differ, and here's a key feature I told you I was going to talk about in a few minutes, in the number of segmentation classes or outputs. So when you're using one of the deep neural networks inside Dragonfly, there are basically three different types. There's the autoencoder style, and then there's binary and multi-class. If we go over and look at, uh, at the uh, Dragonfly web page, uh, so I'll go to theobjects.com, and uh, we'll go to Dragonfly. Whoops, not that page. Go to Dragonfly. Ah, sorry about that. Anyway, we're here. Um, what I wanted to show you is when you look at these, this is an example of a multi-class. So we're going from grayscale image and we're segmenting uh, a phase that's orange, a phase that's blue, a phase that's green, and a phase that's unlabeled. Here's a binary segmentation, so it's either red or not red. And then the other type is where you go from a grayscale channel to a grayscale channel. In this case, you're building a filter that's trying to enhance the resolution. So it's a super resolution image filter. In this case, you're trying to do denoising. But in the input and the output are both grayscale channels. So when I say on this slide that there's the autoencoder style, that's, those are the last two. So the channel is input and the channel is output. 
Binary means you use an ROI or a channel as your target, and multi-class means you use a multi-ROI or a channel as output. When you do this, um, the if you're using someone else's uh, neural network that's already programmed properly, it'll have a, have the right activation function. If if you're trying to do this on your own, it's important to note that if the output is supposed to be a channel, it needs an activation function of type sigmoid. If the act, if the output is supposed to be an ROI or a multiroy, then you'll need something called a softmax as the activation function. The other thing, as I mentioned, we talk about the loss function. When remember, there's a loss function that's evaluated when how to update the neural network um, that's used by the optimizer. So if you're trying to get an output of a channel, mean squared is a good error loss function, or mean squared error is a good loss function. If you're trying to evaluate uh, to get a ROI or a multiroy, the categorical cross entropy is a good loss function. The number of outputs that you're generating um, uh, has to be encoded properly, and so this is the last detail that we'll get into for this call. And that is, you can see that some of these have a number of classes, and that means that if I'm trying to build a three-phase multiroy, it needs to say three here, or if it's a four-phase multiroy, it needs to say four. Now, this can be edited. I can go into, uh, for example, I can go into the editing for this particular this particular network, and I can choose um, the very last um, the very last layer. So there's a convolution 2D layer, and you'll see the number of filters here is set at two. If I just set that to three, then and I save, then this actually now becomes a a three class. Um, a three-class segmenter. So there's a whole lot more detail we could get into, but that's as much as we're going to do for today. So this tells you how to get started, how to train, tells you that uh, training depends on the number of classes of the output. So um, sharing and reusing models is quite easy. If you were uh, in the infinite toolbox and we scroll down and find the uh, find our particular one that we want to share. So if I go to Deep Trainer and I say, um, you know, the the filter that I used for the ceramic matrix composite, it's only on my computer. If I want to share it with everyone else, um, I can type in my information, uh, my contact, a brief bit of information, and then I can click Upload to Infinite Toolbox. That's how you share a model, and then anyone else who's connected on Dragonfly it can go into their Infinite Toolbox account and download and use that model. So the final topic of today is getting help from ORS. Um, and what I want to say is, of course, we, we're, we pride ourselves on the level of customer support, so we'll be happy to answer all answer by email all of the questions that come from users who have a support contract or customers that are in their evaluation period. If you're a user who is no longer paying for support or you're a user who is using a free license, um, we may or may not answer your email depending on how overloaded we are, but we certainly make a priority for customers that uh, are looking at purchasing the software or have already purchased a support contract. Now, for users that would like more help and would like us to train networks for them that they can then reuse so they don't have to uh, go through any of these steps themselves, that's available. You can contact us and we can tell you what's required and what the terms are so that we can do training and tuning of networks specifically for you and your team so that you can have this automated segmentation tool that you can continue to reuse uh, as long as you're collecting data that look like that. We can do that on a free basis for some of our non-commercial users. So there are certain terms and conditions about how we get to reuse the model. Um, if you are interested and you have data or you're willing to uh, do the manual segmentation on your training data, or even if you need our help with that, um, we can discuss that. So we do have limited resources, so that's going to be on a first-come, first-served basis. So if you're interested in, in getting help, um, of course, you can always try and you have enough to do all of this on your own, but if you want the support of our team, we can work with you. So I want to thank you all for your attention. I know it's been an information-packed, dense 50 minutes, but I think uh, that was uh, uh, wanted to give you everything you needed to know to understand what the scope is of the feature, understand what you need to do to get Dragonfly installed with a proper license, and then how you can actually get started by going into the deep learning trainer, pushing all the right buttons, and experiencing these magical filters that automatically give you the results you want. So again, I'll thank you for your attention. This will be available online streaming at a later date, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. If you want to send me email directly, you can email me mmarsh at theobjects.com. You can always email sales at theobjects.com. So thanks so much for your time. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.